Okay. Um, I think I'm going to get started. So welcome everyone to this seventh Trinity Research in the Social Sciences webinar. Uh, I'm Mary Lee Rhodes and I am uh, in the School of Business in Trinity College. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here to chair this presentation uh, from Professor Thomas Philippon uh, from the NYU Business School, Stern Business School. Um, uh, Professor Philippon is the Max L. Heine Professor of Finance uh, in NYU uh, and has won numerous prizes for his work in economics. Um, he's studied and uh, published on various topics in macroeconomics, uh, systemic risk, crisis resolution mechanisms, uh, and today he's going to be talking about com competition and concentration after COVID-19. Um, I was fortunate enough to have a chance to watch his presentation in January um, in Berkeley, and it was competition and concentration before COVID-19. So I'm looking very much forward to hearing uh, what Professor Philippon has to say. What we're going to do today is, uh, Professor Philippon will speak for about 20 minutes um, presenting his work, which is also, uh, you can find in his new book, the Great Reversal, um, which I think is available, but he can let us know if it's not yet. Uh, and then we will have a chance to have a bit of a discussion. Um, he and I will kick off with a couple of questions and then open it up to uh, answer questions from the attendees. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, if you could put your questions into the little Q&A uh, section at the bottom of your screens, that way we can group them together uh, and possibly uh, with any luck get through uh, the, the vast bulk of, of questions asked. So without further ado, um, I'd like to welcome Professor Thomas Philippon uh, from NYU to talk about competition and concentration after COVID-19. Well, thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be uh, with you and um, to, uh, to talk about <laughs> You know, competition is what I researched in my book. And of course, when I wrote the book, I had no idea that we would be doing uh, all our conferences via Zoom and that we would be uh, in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, but um, as it turns out, the, the pandemic itself is going to have an impact on market dynamics and competition in particular. So I think it's, uh, it's quite fitting. Um, so what I'm planning to do is to, to talk for about 20 minutes about um, a few key ideas from the book and then a few new ideas from the post-COVID world. Uh, so, so we can have an, uh, like an informed discussion uh, afterwards, but um, I'm not going to get into all the details, of course, and I will leave plenty of uh, open issues for further discussions. Um, so I'll give you some background from, from the book. The book was published in the fall and you can find it um, I mean, it came out in the in Ireland and the UK, so you can find it in your bookstore or on Amazon. Um, so I'll give you some background from, from the book, and then uh, we'll talk about the post-COVID uh, shock. Okay, so the book is called The Great Reversal, and I chose the title because it corresponds to my experience uh, as a European living in the US. When I left Europe um, to, to go to the US as a student, in 1999, it was striking that the US, uh, despite being richer than Europe, um, had more competitive markets. And you would see it right away as a consumer because you would pay less for the same goods and services than you would in uh, Paris or Dublin or, Germ or Berlin or London. Um, and again, this is surprising because when a country is richer, typically prices are higher. And that's what we call the balasa samuelson effect. So the, the US has always been about 20% richer than Europe on a per capita basis. It's about the same today as it was 30 years ago, or 20 years ago. Um, so you would expect many goods and services to be more expensive. But in fact, uh, when I arrived in the US, it was much cheaper to, for instance, get a connection to internet. Now remember, that's around 2000. Um, I'm a PhD student, so I, I really need internet to work. Um, and it was much cheaper to get my internet connection in Boston than it was in Paris. Why? Because the US had deregulated the telecom business and it was very competitive. 20 years later, things are reversed. 
And they haven't just marginally reversed, they have massively reversed. So today, it's more than twice more expensive to get um, you know, fiber or broadband internet at home in the US than in France. The median household pays about $30 per month in France for a broadband connection. Um, and in the US, it's $68. That's for broadband, right? So that's for fiber going to your home. If you look at uh, wireless connection on your cell phone, the differences are even larger. The, the, your average cell phone bill in the, in the US for the same exact number of megabytes, same speed, um, is more than twice, so close to three times more expensive than what people pay in France. So how on earth did that happen over 20 years? Well, the US went from being significantly cheaper to being outrageously more expensive. So that's why I call the good the great reversal. I'm trying to understand what's going on. In the case of the telecom industry, it's really not that complicated. Uh, as the US telecom industry became more concentrated, markup rose. So here you see on this figure, CR8 on the right hand side, it's um, the, the red dot. It's uh, the market share of the top eight firms. So it's a measure of concentration. And as you can see, there's a very large increase in the 2000s of uh, the market share of the big firms by about you know, 30 percent, 30 percentage points. So it's a massive increase. Um, at the same time, not surprisingly, the profit margin increase. So the markup goes up by something like also 30 percent. Um, so this is what happened in telecom. As we will see, in, at this very same time in Europe, we went exactly the other way, which is concentration and prices and markups went down, which is why it created this massive difference over 20 years. Now, telecom is a bit extreme. Okay, so there are many industries in the US that have remained competitive. So if you take a broader picture and you look at all the industries together, which this picture shows you, that's the change in concentration for the non-manufacturing sector in red and the manufacturing sector in green, uh, green circles. Um, you can see that the increase uh, according to this measure is about seven or eight percentage points. Now these, are, these data are much more aggregated so the baseline concentration is like 20%. So you, you move from 20 to 27. So give or take, you know, a few, um, um, a few percentage points, you can think of it roughly as if you had an industry in the US with roughly four big firms 20 years ago, then on average, that industry today would have only three big firms remaining. Okay. So that's kind of more or less what, what happened with, on average, with a lot of dispersion across industries. Um, so that's the, that's the background of where we are, okay? The rise of concentration in the US economy over the past 20 years. Now, the thing that's very important to understand, and the book talks in great details about that, is concentration itself may or may not be good or bad. There is good concentration and there is bad concentration. So. Even if we agree that concentration has gone up, we might still disagree on whether we need to do something about it. Good concentration happens when um, concentration comes together with low prices, high productivity, and a lot of intangible investment. So typically what happens is the firms that were already pretty good get even better by doing a lot of IT investment. Then they pull ahead even more from the rest of the pack. So what you see in the data is concentration is going up, right? Because the big firms are getting even better or the leaders are getting even better. So you see concentration going up, but it's driven by the fact that the leaders are doing the right thing. They are trying hard to innovate and to become more productive. In that case, at least um, initially, you don't need to worry about concentration. It's just the outcome of market competition. So that's fine. And we do see a lot of that in the US. We've seen a lot of that in the US in retail and wholesale trade. And I think we still see it today in these sectors. Um, that concentration, of course, is pretty much the flip side of it. So you, you see concentration going up, but it comes together with high prices, low productivity, and or bad service. Okay, And that's exactly what you see in telecoms, airlines, and healthcare in the US. So I don't think there is, at least in my mind, there's just no not much controversy about, about these examples. But of course, these are you know, just five examples here. So the question is for the bulk of industries, where are we? Are we more in the good concentration camp or more in the bad concentration uh, camp? Um, and um, 
it turns out I think we move from one to the other. So let me give you an example just to fix ideas about what good consumption looks like. So this is the expansion of Walmart, so retail trade, okay, big, big uh, retail of stores. Walmart had essentially zero market share in the 1970s. And then starting in the 80s, uh, its market share starts to grow. So the market share is measured on the right. So you see it's zero, 20%, 40%, 60%. That's not a typo, right? It is 60% at the end. One firm has 60% of the, the market. That's how successful they were at you know, spreading and building big uh, retail, big box stores. Um, now you might worry about that, but on the other hand, if you look at what happens to prices, productivity, profit margins, it looks pretty good. So the profit margin of Walmart in green, as you can see, if anything, was slightly falling during the expansion. What that's telling you is that um, every single 1% increase in productivity that Walmart achieved was passed on as lower prices to consumers. Okay. And the productivity gains of Walmart were staggering, actually. They were huge in the 1990s, all driven by IT. So pretty much everything today that you think of as innovation retail trade, just-in-time inventory management, the idea that you know, as soon as you scan something in a, in a, in a store, then the, the information is sent to the producer on the other side of the planet so that they can start producing a, a new item. All of these innovations, the platform for retailers to manage their inventories directly on Walmart's website. All of that was invented by Walmart. Um, so the, I like that example for two other reasons. The first is that it is not a, um, you know, it's not uh, like motherhood and apple pie. It's even if it's good for consumer, it's still controversial, right? They put a lot of people out of business. They put many small stores out of business. So competition is tough. It creates winners and losers. But at the very least, you know, you can make the case that they increase productivity, which means they increase wages in real terms, and um, they, they, they give low prices to consumers. Um, so I think that's why I would classify that as good type of concentration, even though it is still controversial in many aspects. The second point that I like about it is forward to the fast forward to the mid 2000s so that's when the, uh, this plateau at the end where walmart reaches about you know 60 percent market share and then it's kind of flat it, what's interesting about that period around 2005 is people are aware of walmart being really big and very successful and scary and so you have talks about antitrust against walmart um, in fact regulators start to step in in various ways um, and then just as Presumably, we were thinking about doing something, some antitrust case, some regulation, something to, to tame the growth of Walmart. What happened? Well, competition arrived. And just like in your textbook case, it arrived from a place we didn't see it coming. It, it, of course, the competition was Amazon, and Amazon is not a big box retailer. So in fact, the 60% does not include Amazon because online retailing was not classified as the same industry in the first place. That's where the competition came from. And then from there on, Amazon and Walmart have been competing in retail. So that retail today is very competitive in the US. Okay, so to, to take away here is you have fierce competition, IT investment, lower prices, productivity growth. And by the time you start to worry about the firm becoming too dominant, the market solved the problem for you by bringing competition from outside. So this is capitalism the way it should work, okay? And the question is, this is what, this is what we see today? And my answer is roughly no. So um, this graph is complicated, so I can't give you all the details. Happy to come back to that in the discussion. But basically what we did here is we put together all the, um, you know, all the information we have about the concentration dynamics and we grouped the data in two ways. Um, one, one way is the good concentration um, picture where Essentially, you see concentration, but it comes together with productivity, low prices, and stuff like that. And then we measure the prevalence of this. That's the green line. So it's kind of flat. It was going up in the 90s, so that's consistent with the, what we see in Walmart. But then it flattens out. It doesn't disappear. Okay. So the green line being flat means the prevalence of um, good type concentration has not disappeared, but it hasn't increased. It's been flat. And the red one is the the other side, which is the bad concentration. Okay, so this is when we see concentration, but 
we see it with no entry of new firms. We see it with high prices, low productivity. Um, and that was not very prevalent in the 1990s and it became much more prevalent in the 2000s. So that's my main claim in the book, which is that it, I'm not saying that good, good contortion dynamics have disappeared. I'm, th I'm saying they've become much less prevalent than the bad style concentration. So for every Walmart now, you have two telecom industries that charge you really crazy prices for lousy service. So this is what happened in, in the US. Now the question is what happened in Europe. And um, there is plenty of reasons to look at Europe. Well, as Europeans, we care, of course. Um, it's also very interesting because um, it's um, what we call a good control group in economics, in the sense that Europe has very similar markets. In, in fact, all the industries I've discussed so far, uh, they are essentially identical in Europe. They have the same technology, the same kind of organization. Um, and so, you know, if we see a different outcome in Europe, we know it's not driven by technology because we use the same cell phones, we use the same towers for broadcasting wireless, we use the same planes, yeah, the same technology in the airport and so on and so forth. Um, and what's striking is Europe has a very different um, you know, evolution over the past 20 years. And it's mostly driven by the fact that Europe um, finally, you could say, uh, reform its product market. So this is an index from the OECD and the IMF. Um, well, this particular one is from Divaredal from the IMF. Um, well, they just count the number of product market reforms in Europe. And you can see with the implementation of a single market uh, in the 1990s, we have a sharp and sustained increase in the number of reforms. So um, for almost, you know, 10, 15 years, we have on average one, re one important product market reform per country per year in Europe. What does it look like? Well, one I like very much is the telecom industry in France, which went from being lousy and uncompetitive to being amazingly competitive. So this is the price level of communication services in France. Um, it's very broad, by the way. It includes more than Wi-Fi and or more than the uh, you know, wireless connection on your phone. Uh, in France, relative to the US. So the fact that it's 1.15 uh, here tells you that France was about 15% more expensive than the US for these uh, services in uh, 2010 or 2011. And then within two years or three, it went from being 15% more expensive to being you know, 25% cheaper. And it's kept going down since then. Now, this is a massive, this is, this is a big, this is an industry like billions of euros of revenue each year. This is very big, okay? So that's an industry which is very large and the relative price moves by 40% in three years. So this is something you notice. It's not like, you know, measurement error. It's like a massive shift. And this shift was triggered pretty much by one thing, which is we gave a license to a fourth telecom operator. We, had, we used to have three operators, classic oligopoly, three firms charging the same price. Everything was at, you know, $49.99. Um, and then um, Free Mobile was asking for a license to enter the, the wireless uh, market and uh, got denied the license under heavy lobbying by the incumbent course, arguing towards the regulator that really they don't need a force competitor because the market couldn't take it. Um, and the usual BS that they give. Um, and of course, uh, at some point, thankfully, the regulator decided that that was nonsense. So they gave the license to free, which entered the market uh, at exactly half the price of the incumbent. So what for the same contract, um, where the incumbent were charging you 40 euros, free offer the same contract for 20 euros. And within less than a year, the incumbent had to match the price. So everybody went on to 20 euros and that's, we've been there since then. So that's one example of product market reform. In that case, you see it's triggered by a change in the regulation of a license. Okay, so it's a licensing requirement change. Um, Product market reforms are very diverse. Okay, so sometimes it could be linked to antitrust. Oftentimes it's changes in regulations, or something licensing requirements and, and stuff like that. Um, I'm very happy to talk about the airlines if you want in the Q&A, because it's pretty much the same thing. If you look at the expansion of uh, EasyJet and Ryanair, it's essentially the same story. Um, so I'm happy to give you much more uh, details about that if you want. But again, let's zoom out and let's look at the whole picture. So these are index, this is an index of the tightness of regulation. Um, each green dot is one country in Europe and the red line is the US. And uh, the first vintage of this data from the OECD is 1998. 
um, the publication. So the data was collected in uh, you know 96, 97. So what they do is they, they they count how many regulations countries have, and then they group them into four bins, and then they add them up. So if you if you regulate all kinds of entry, if you put license environment everywhere, it's very hard for firms to enter and compete. Then you you have a four. Four would be the worst case. So Poland was pretty bad, um, you know. And then uh, this green dot at the bottom, I know you, I'm sure you can guess that's the UK, the only country in Europe that has a tradition of free market. And the US was the leader by far. Um, but then over time, as you can see, gradually, European countries start to converge towards the, e the US level. In fact, many countries in Europe today have better or are more, more competitive regulations. It's easier to enter and compete in many industries in Europe today than in the US. That's the shift we've seen over the past 20 years in Europe. Okay? And then, not surprisingly, that's why we have lower prices for many of the goods and services that we buy. So that's the evolution of the markup. Um, for the entire EU 10, so the 10 largest countries in Europe for which I can have good enough data, versus uh, the US. So you can see in the US this sustained rise in the market, which really means, just to be clear, the market just means prices uh, you know, increase faster than wages in that case, um, adjusting for productivity and other things like that. But uh, this is the market going up is your uh, living standards going down. And in Europe, it's been mostly flat. Yes, even slightly declining, perhaps. Um, so that's what the big difference is. By my estimates, at the end of the sample, the US prices are about 10%, somewhere between 7 and 10% too high, um, compared to where they would be if uh, the US had remained um, competitive at home, if the US market had remained competitive. So to put some numbers on that, that's about $300 per uh, household. But for the median household in the US, it's about $300 per month extra they are paying. Um, remember that most there is a very large, about 40% of households in the US who would not be able to cope with a few hundred dollars unexpected expenditure. So they are, they are wasting or they are being um, stolen is a strong word perhaps, but they are being deprived of $300 per month just for pure monopoly rent. Um, if you aggregate across all households and over 12 months, you get $600 billion. That's a direct transfer from households to monopolies in the US every year. Um, and then if you do the right thing in terms of economic analysis, which is you do a counterfactual, so you imagine what would happen to the US um, economy if um, we could somehow you know, turn the clock back to 2000 and bring back some competition in many of these markets. Then my estimate is private GDP would go up by $1 trillion. Labor income would go up by $1.25 trillion because competition is really good for labor. Um, and profits would go down by $250 billion because, of course, the margins of firms would go down. So capital income would go down by $250 billion. Labor income by $1.25, adding them up, GDP would go up by $1 trillion. Um, so that's how much we are losing um, each year because of lack of competition in the US. And it hits, it's just really bad for the, mid, for the middle class. Okay. Uh, again, I, I'm happy to tell you more about that if you want to understand the distribution effect, but competition is mostly good for, uh, for distribution in that case. Okay, so this is like the, that's where we were, you know, six months ago. And all the talk about reviving antitrust, uh, doing something against big tech, all of that took place in the context of this increase in profit margin markups and concentration in the US. Okay? And, uh, um, and against the backdrop of a rather successful story in Europe, where thanks to many things, again, that I'm very happy to discuss in the Q&A, we managed to um, improve the life of our consumers and the standards of living of our citizens. Um, now, what will COVID do? And, um, well, so, you know, we all have a lot of time to read, so I, I, I read back what I wrote, and I'm pretty happy with most of what I wrote in the book. I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to be just um, as relevant post-COVID. There's one number that I have to change in the next edition of the book, which in the book, um, I look in details at the big tech firms, so Amazon, um, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, okay, which happen to be the five most valuable companies in the U.S. today. Um, and I want to understand, you know, whether, you know, it's, of course, these are big firms, uh, but are they exceptional? 
um, you know, what should we think of them? And one of the points I make is that they are not that exceptional. And every time you hear somebody tell you, oh, these are firms that are gigantic and they are much bigger than anything we've seen in the past, this is not true. And the one way to, to look at it is this data that you, show, that you see here. So this is the, the share of the equity market, of the total equity market that is accounted for by the top five firms. Okay, and as you can see, it's 10% over the past 30 years, except of course, this last point is post COVID, I just recomputed. Um, so this decade by decade, so 85 means for the decade of the 80s, 90s, 2000s, the 2010s, until literally 2019, right? So pre COVID. And, and it's so remarkably stable at around 10%. What is that telling you? It's telling you that um, the market share, or the, if you look at the value of Apple relative to the US stock market, there's nothing strange there. It's exactly the same as IBM's market value relative to the value of the US market in the 1970s. Um, and if you put the, the five of them together, it's 10%, or it used to be 10%, just like it was in the past. The names changed. The leading firms of the 80s, they would include uh, IBM, of course, Procter & Gamble, ExxonMobil, um, you know, um, so the names would change decade by decade. Okay. Uh, Walmart would appear, of course, in the 2000 or late nineties. Um, so it's not always the top firms. This is not just always the same firm that are at the top, but the typically the, t the top five or 10 firms are extremely successful by definition. And so they account for a large share of the market. And it's, there's nothing unusual about Google, Facebook, and co in that respect. That's why I wrote in the book. This was true pre-COVID. This is what COVID did to these statistics. It's 18% today. Now that is big. That is much louder than before. Why? Because um, COVID was the perfect storm for this company, but in a good sense. Um, because their business model turned out to be the most resilient because they can easily switch everything online. So you could have imagined many other global crisis that would have been really bad for online companies or for Apple or for Amazon. But if you think about one global crisis that would be good for this company, it would have to be something like a global pandemic. Okay. Because these firms can do everything online so they can safely provide the service. And in fact, in the case of Amazon, even more than that, uh, you know, clearly the demand for uh, online shopping went up. So today we have, we, we already had an issue of concentration in the tech sector. Um, that is actually much bigger today. So whatever you thought about that issue six months ago, it's a much bigger issue today. Um, so that's the first thing I would change um, if I had to write the book today. The second thing I would change is, um, you know, the involvement of the government and in particular, uh, what would happen to small and medium sized enterprises. Um, so the, the, the thing that's from an economic perspective, the thing that could be potentially the most devastating and also the most specific about the COVID crisis is what it will do to small and medium sized firms. Um, they were hit very hard. And many of them are going to be struggling with excess debt levels for, you know, years. During the lockdown, we had uh, programs designed to help this firm. So more or less all of them were inspired by the successful courts arbeit uh, programs in Germany, which essentially means that um, during the lockdown, government would pick up the wage bill. Okay, so instead of firms firing people, the government said, keep people on your payroll and I'll, I'll reimburse you for the payroll, which is essentially a good idea. It works very well. We also had loan guarantees for other types of bills that firms had to pay. Um, so that was during the lockdown. Now, now that we are moving into the reopening phase, uh, clearly we want to switch. Uh, we want to make sure that the unemployment doesn't go through the roof. So we want to encourage job creation and we want to limit bankruptcies because many of these small firms now have, you know, lower revenues because the lockdown, because the reopening is slow. Um, so they have lower revenues and they have higher debt levels. So the, the other big thing that we need to worry about um, post COVID is um, preventing a massive amount of failures of small firms. And if we don't, then we're going to have even more of an issue of concentration. Okay. Because at the top, as we saw the super, successful firm, 
did even better during the crisis. So at the top, the contortion went up. At the bottom, you want to keep active, you know, small and medium-sized firms because they some of them become successful and start competing with the bigger ones. Okay, so if you have a high death rate among small firms, then that's going to be really bad for the next 10 or 20 years. Um, so which means that today, the goal should be to preserve as much as possible the firms that are viable. Uh, so the goal of policy should be to close, of course, the firms that are not viable, because there is no point keeping zombie firms around, but keep the viable ones. Now, the ones that are viable and solvent, there is no issue, they're going to survive by themselves. The ones that are viable but insolvent, because they have too much debt, then you do something. We need to restructure the, the debt. And uh, so we've been working on that issue with Olivier Blanchard and Jean Pizaniferi uh, over the past six months. And we have a, a proposal for how you do it optimally. Um, and again, remember, the goal here is that we are worried about excessive liquidation of small firms. And the question is, how can the government prevent uh, this excessive liquidation? So our idea is to have a, an incentive scheme where the government encourages private walkout. Okay. So essentially the government says or offers a, a contract or, or standing facility where they, uh, the government tells banks and private creditors in general, do your private workout. So if the firm has too much debt, you know you're gonna have to, rest either you're gonna liquidate or you're gonna have to restructure. Um, and then, so we encourage you to do your private workout. Out of court is, is faster and more efficient. So try to reach an agreement together. Um, if you don't agree, uh, then we're just gonna apply the bankruptcy code. And uh, the government oftentimes a senior creditor because taxes, you know, uh, social security contributions, all of these are senior claims. So the government is going to get a lot of this money first. Um, so if you don't, if you guys don't agree, we're going to go to bankruptcy the usual way. It's probably not going to be very pretty. On the other hand, if you reach an agreement, which typically means that the private creditors are going to agree to lower their debt, or or lengthen their debt, you know, move from a, like a three-year claim to a five-year claim to give more time for the firms to pay it back. Okay. Um, then the government is going to match and improve on that. Okay. So if private creditors agree to lengthen their claim from three to five years, then the government is going to do the same thing on all of its claims. So typically the, the loans, the guaranteed loans the, giver, the government gave out during the crisis would automatically lengthen their maturity. And you can also do it on its uh, tax claims. You can say, well, you know, if the private creditors agree to uh, work out and, and extend the maturity, then I will forgive you six months of social security contributions or taxes, income taxes, or, um, you know, um, employer paid uh, contributions. So that scheme gives good incentives to private creditors to reach an agreement, okay? And the government is going to participate and put a little bit more of an effort because the government takes into account the fact that it has a vested interest in keeping the firms alive. Okay. Um, so this is the uh, optimal thing to do. And uh, we, uh, we argue that uh, if we do something like that, then we, we, can, we can save many of these small firms without breaking the, the taxpayers uh, back with, uh, with taxes and transfers. So these are the two things to me that are critical post-COVID. From an economic perspective, of course, there is the epidemic and the, the health part of it. But um, from the economic perspective, is um, you know, making sure that the SMEs can survive the the next uh, twelve months. Okay, that's it. So happy to um, you know go back to any of the things I said that I went very quick. I'm happy to go back and discuss them in details. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. It, that really fascinating presentation. And um, I do have to say that some of the sources of information that you've pulled together there are enormously helpful um, and ones I had not been aware of. Who knew that there was a whole database of reforms available to us to, to look at? Um, we have a couple of questions, but I think if, if you'll indulge me, um, I, I did watch uh, another presentation of uh, some of your findings here, and there were a couple of points that I think, because of time here, you skipped over, which may be of use or be interesting to the audience here. As I said, it's a very mixed group of social scientists. And the specific areas I'm talking about, they, they show up 
uh, on slide five and slide 10 in your deck. One is about the United States and it's the, the sort of change, the rapid change uh, in concentration uh, in the United States that happened towards the late 90s, early uh, 2000s. And in, your, in other presentations, you've talked about some of the drivers for that. Uh, you talked about lobbying, you talked about antitrust and how it was uh, pursued, et cetera. So on the one hand, some drivers that might have led to the kinds of concentration that we saw uh, in the US. And on the other hand, on slide 10, you have the, the diagram of this kind of outfl uh, outflow of reforms. And in another presentation, you talked a bit about the very structure of the European Union and how sort of Nash equilibriums helped explain, or Nash equilibrium helped explain yeah. why there would have been that, uh, that kind of dynamic going on. I just wonder if you might just tease those out a bit, the drivers of some of these, these dynamics. Oh yeah, absolutely. So um, let me just be completely honest. I, I think I have a pretty good story and understanding of Europe and I don't have a full story for the US. Um, so let's start with Europe because I think it's simpler. Um, the reason it's simpler to analyze is because the timing is relatively clear. You know, once we decided to have a single market with free trade, uh, completely free trade within the EU, then that changed the game completely. Um, and everything more or less followed from that. Um, and the good thing with that timing is we know what happened in the mid nineties. Okay. So you, you know, you know where you look for the break and you just, just need to try to understand the break. So the contribution I make in the book is to actually fully understand the, the, the true consequences of the single market. Um, and the main um, takeaway for me was that um, you would expect a pretty drastic change in institutions once you move to a single market. Okay. So one way to, 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 exp to frame the question is, um, as we saw, as I showed you, like in the, before the 1990s, um, you know, the U S had by far uh, the most competitive markets. And as you could see through the green dots, they were all way, way above the U S that's just saying that apart from the UK, um, no country, especially no country on continental Europe had a tradition of free market. Okay. Um, they all had the tradition. French was actually the polar opposite with like very strong state intervention creation of national champions, like the opposite of what we think of it as, as, as free markets. And together with that, of course, in uh, regulators that were not independent. So the French regulators were pretty much taking their orders directly from the finance ministry. Okay. That's all consistent. If you think the politicians should be doing industrial policy and then you need to have, they need to have control and then you don't want independent regulators and you worry about competition, unfettered competition sounds like a bad idea. So this is all consistent. That's the tradition that Europe came from. Now, the thing that's very interesting is, suppose now you take 18 people like that, more or less coming from the same tradition, you put them around the table and you ask them to design institutions for the EU level. That's where it gets interesting because the naive answer would be, that they would probably do the same thing they did at home, right? So then you would expect the EU level institutions to be designed as sort of like a mirror image of each national institution, okay? And that naive answer is completely wrong. And that's where the Nash equilibrium concept in game theory is interesting because the game is drastically different. The game of one politician in his own country doing industrial policy is completely different from the game of 18 countries working together in a single market. And the main difference is if you are in the single market, then you have to worry about not just you being able to influence the regulators or the, or the institutions or the laws in your favor. You have to worry about every other one being able to do the same thing against you. Okay. That's that does not exist at the country level. So then the overwhelming concern switches completely from a desire to influence the outcome, which every politician of course likes to have, towards a desire to be sure that the others cannot influence the outcomes against you. And then the national problem is going to be that uh, at the EU level, we're all going to agree that we are better off if we make the regulations very independent, the regulators very independent, pro-consumer, because that's the best way to protect ourselves against 
each of us trying to waste our time influencing the regulator against us. Okay. Which is why the paradox is the EU created the most independent antitrust regulator in the world, by far. Okay. Why? Because that's not the tradition we had at the national level. Well, once you understand the game is different, you understand why the outcome is different. So I think that's a beautiful example of uh, Nash equilibrium. Um, the same exact thing happened by, for the ECB, by the way. Just like the European Central Bank is more independent than the Fed. Okay, so even though people think of Milton Friedman as the guy advocating for central bank independence, who's American. So why did the Europeans go you know, further than the Americans? What's well, the same exact story? So I think that explains Europe. And then once you understand this really basic fundamental change, then everything else follows because then you have the influence of the EU level to the national institution that's like a feedback and slowly diffuses over time. I think everything starts to make sense. In the US, it's a bit more complicated because you don't have an obvious breaking point. Um, and then you have like competing ideas. My sense is that they're all roughly right. And then what we see is a mix of different things. Um, there's a long-term trend towards um, influenced by the Chicago school, trying to convince the courts, the judges, that really you don't need to worry about market dominance and monopoly power because they can't stay, they can't sustain themselves. Right, because by the, the argument was is almost circular, but it's saying, look, if there's a monopoly, they're going to make tons of money. If they make tons of money, they're going to attract uh, competition. And so you don't need to worry about it because the market is going to bring competition if, if there is none, which is like a tautology. This is the same I think competition can never be an issue. So, uh, but that was kind of influential. And um, that started really in the 80s. And you see a very slow change in the way courts interpret the law. Um, at the same time, you see at the state level, more and more regulation against um, free, tr free entry. So licensing requirements, non-compete clause start to creep up. Um, that's more like the late 90s. Um, and then in the 2000s, you add to that a gigantic increase in corporate lobbying targeted towards um, the, the regulators of free market, so the SEC or the DOJ, and dir either directly or indirectly via uh, the uh, politicians, senators, or members of Congress sitting on the committees who get the chance to vote the budget of the antitrust regulators. Okay? And for some reason that I don't fully understand, there's a very large increase in, in lobbying expenditures in the 2000s in the US. So I think when you combine all these pieces together, you end up where they are today. But you see, it's not like a neat story. You can see you can pinpoint one clear moment in history where things start to change. I think it changes gradually and I don't know why it sort of crystallizes in the 2000s specifically. One of the, um, one of the attendees put a question in that perhaps gives a, a, another route to looking into what might have driven it. There's, the question is around um, sort of the erosion of tax base through um, the erosion of tax base in countries because companies have the chance they can move all over the world. Yeah. Um, so globalization coming in to allow companies even more leverage in any given country to so, say, well, I can get a better deal elsewhere if, you know, I'm not, if my, my home market isn't, isn't uh, protected. Is yeah, that absolutely. So that's, that's a plausible also uh, explanation, which is if you think that the large companies are becoming more global, then that means the resources they can muster relative to the size of their home market. If you, think, if you think a world in which companies are global, but they are still, uh, in terms of regulation, domestic, in a sense, then the, the, the amount of resources they have access to, which is now scaled by the whole world, becomes larger relative to the amount of resources their regulators are going to have, which is still tied to their home market. Okay. So that's a plausible story for why large firms would, would essentially um, outrun the regulators because they are they become larger relative to their national economies. Um, yeah, all of that is plausible. The problem I have with, uh, with all of this as a social scientist is I don't know how to test these theories. In Europe, I, can, I know how to test because it's, I know what I'm looking for. In, in the US, it's a little difficult to have a precise test to know which one is more important. But I think it's part of the story for sure. Oh, it's a, a really interesting kinds of insights there. Um, another question that came up, which was asked before you actually presented the slide that talked about uh, the impact or your calculated impact on GDP uh, of the monopolistic behavior. The question is, well, if it's suppressing GDP, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and we see this big difference in concentration or the, the direction of concentration in Europe versus the US, would we expect to see GDP per capita in Europe catch up, out, outrun, uh, yeah, outrun actually, the US? Yeah, that's exactly right. So, so we should, all else equal, uh, we, we would expect a catch up. Um, and uh, I think we do see a catch up in a sense at the industry level, but not much in the aggregate. Um, which um, then the question is why? So clearly, if you if you if you think about um, GDP per capita is how much you can buy, right, as a household. So it's how much you earn relative to how much you pay. So clearly, if you think about um, take the median household uh, in Europe and think about how much they can buy in terms of uh, internet access and healthcare, more than the US, and definitely more more than the US over the next twenty years. That's for sure. Um, now, if you aggregate to all the industries, it still doesn't show up. And it's, it's a little bit, I think there's a lot of measurement issues there. And there's also, but I think there's a controverting force, which is um, the US is still doing well or very well in many different areas. So while like US consumers get ripped off by their healthcare providers, by their health insurance, by their telecom providers, um, they also pay more than they should for energy and transport. Okay, all of that is true, but the U.S. as a whole is still home to the best universities and the best tech companies. And over the past 20 years, these have been the engines of growth. Um, and Europe is still lacking in this dimension. So I think maybe that's one of those and these things tend to cancel out and we don't see a, a very large change. Um, but I still believe that if you look at the, that's the thing I'm trying to work on now. I think if you properly measure the living standard of the median household, like the middle class by the median household, I think it's improved more in Europe than in the US over the past 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not as easy as you think to, to, to show it. Yeah, yeah, admittedly from, from very different bases. So uh, that would be an interesting, an interesting study. Um, we have one technical question, which I will save if we have time at the end, uh, because I think a very a niche group will be interested in this. Um, there's a question now of the future. So we talked about sort of what drove this, where are we now, uh, and a little bit about uh, what's going to happen now post-COVID. So another question came in saying, how do you think that the concentration and credit constraints may interact, um, both not only affecting the recovery overall, uh, but also affecting kind of each other. So how will uh, concentration uh, and credit interact in, in the future, in post-COVID? So, um, I mean, so the, the, you have different ways. I think if, if you think about the credit market, and um, you have private credit and public credit. So private credit is, in Europe specifically, it's uh, mostly banks, um, and there, the, Let's actually, let's start with good news uh, in, because, you know, my, I also do financial regulations and for the past 10 years, I've been working on, you know, how do you make the banks safer after the last big blow up we had uh, 10 years ago, right? And, and there, let's honestly, for once, be happy with what we've done. It's not perfect, but we've massively increased the equity buffers of banks, which means that today, thanks to that effort over the past 10 years, we don't have a gigantic banking crisis in the midst of a pandemic, which we would have for sure if we had the same leverage ratios in banks that we had in 2007. Then today, there's absolutely no doubt that we would be in the midst of a pandemic and a massive financial crisis at the same time. So the good news is we are, we are not there because the banks are much more solid. Now they're still vulnerable, there's still stuff that can go wrong, but that's massively better. Um, so I think we want to keep it that way. So I think we need to be very proactive. I'm in favor of preventing banks from paying dividend over the next two years, just by precaution. Uh, I want to, them to be uh, as capitalized as possible. So I think no bank should be paying dividend over the next two years, period, um, just as a precautionary measure. Then we have the backstop from the ECB in, in Europe, uh, which is, has been very efficient. The central banks have done a pretty good job, I think, doing this whole thing. Um, so I think we managed to successfully backstop the whole system. Today, going forward, the issue is more like this insolvency issue. So it's really an issue of sorting out, you know, the big challenge, if you think about it, is we know some businesses are going to have to change. Uh, 
we're going to have for sure fewer restaurants, at least for, you know, a year. Uh, people's habits in terms of traveling, tourism are going to change. Uh, their consumption habit is going to change. Many things are going to come back to exactly the way they were as soon as we have a vaccine. But we don't know exactly which one. Okay. So we are in this period of massive uncertainty. And then firms have more debt on their balance sheet because they had to take, some, take on debt to, to go through the lockdown period. So what we face today is the issue of sorting out which firms should be continuing, which firm we need to close and try to reallocate the worker to doing something else um, in real time. Okay. So to me, that's the big question. So it's not so, I, I'm not too, too, too worried about like a massive credit crunch in the aggregate, like what we had in 09, because the banks are healthy, because the central banks are on top of it, and we have instruments to prevent that. But I'm very worried about more like the, the more finely tuned, you know, allocation of credit in the cross section. So that's where the issue is. And that's where I think the effort should be. Mm. Okay. Um, there's your, just what, it made me think of one question, your last bit around the kinds of uh, interventions you might propose to ensure that there's sufficient innovation and sufficient ongoing input into a, a, a free market. You need to have companies that can you know, get yep. big enough to survive and then uh, uh, challenge the incumbents. And one of the things we have in Ireland is a very... Uh, interesting dynamic where companies get to one size and then the entrepreneurs basically sell out yeah. pretty much across the board, uh, you know, whether it's tech or pharma or whatever, you don't see entrepreneurs going from being a really successful small or medium sized enterprise to really challenging uh, large uh, global incumbents. Do you see that there needs to be any sort of intervention there? Are you seeing that dynamic elsewhere? Uh, what would you what would you do about that? Oh, that that's a great point. Um, I think we see these dynamics both in the U.S. and in Europe. The fact that we see it in both places tell you something interesting. We see it more in Europe traditionally. Um, so I would I would say there are two key points to me. The first one is Europe and specific, uh, which is we need to finish the single market. Um, you know we cannot just keep complaining about not having say the Google or the Facebook of Europe without realizing that one of the reasons is because we don't have a single market for, for these kind of services. So, you know, if you create a successful platform, um, then you still need to go through the, you know, whatever, 27 different regulations, uh, regulatory regime, consumer protection data, and all of that. So the GDPR helps in standardizing some of these things, but it's still the case that we don't have a single market there. You cannot just have one platform that immediately have access to 350 million people which is what we need if we want this firm to scale up. So at the EU level, to me, that's the priority, which is finish, make it easy for firms to become pan-European firms. I think to me, that's like challenge number one in Europe, for sure. Um, the second point I would make is uh, even, you, even the US has this issue um, of entrepreneurs selling out uh, too early. Um, it's, that's, it's hard to fine tune because uh, historically, many small businesses and many new ventures fail. Um, and among the ones that do not fail, a large fraction get bought by existing firms. And it's probably efficient, um, but it's important to keep these 5% or 10% who actually want to make it on their own <clears throat> and become independent firms. And that number has been dropping in the US as well. So there it's not an issue of single market. It's an issue of too much power by the incumbent. So that's a standard issue watch and that should be in the form of uh, yeah the, in the u.s specifically and in the tech sector in particular for sure it comes with uh, there should be much more regulatory attention to uh, acquisition by, by, by big firms so that's like an antitrust issue to a large extent yeah well um listen Thomas, this is this was fascinating and we've still got a couple of questions but it is kind of the end of the hour uh, and to be respectful of your time and and everyone else's time on here i think i might bring this to a close um, suggest to people that they get the book because it, I'm sure in, in the book there's some technical appendices about how exactly you're measuring yes. concentration because yes. um, that was one of the one of the questions uh, and then lastly some of the, the longer term distribution effects of what this means for people's lives um, and incomes uh, across the, the various countries so thank you very much for that it was a pleasure having you, um, you. I, are you in New York at this at this point yeah, um, and thankfully I'm in upstate New York in the countryside, not in the okay. city. Well, s stay safe and healthy, and hopefully sometime you'll be able to visit us and we'll see you.
on the grounds of Trinity, which is the picture behind. Oh yeah, I, I absolutely love going to Dublin, so anytime. Okay, and let me just thank also um, Ronan Lyons, uh, who is the head of uh, TRIS for organizing this one and, and all the other sessions. Uh, and also thank all of our attendees for staying with us throughout this hour. Thanks very thank much. So much. Bye. And uh, stay safe out there. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.